Welcome to Spitballing. Now for part two of our interview with Chris Voth. So, nice. So anyway, right, that so was that was like, funny. But, but I got a great lesson in how to tell jokes because you got you're doing fifteen to twenty five trips around the jungle per day, like depending on how busy it is. Mm-hmm. So you're doing fifteen to twenty five sets every day that are ten to twelve minute sets, right? Even wow. though they're not your jokes, you you learn how to like inflection the delivery, yeah. cadence, delivery timing all of that and yeah. having a different audience and how one audience laughs really hard at this and the next one does nothing and then, wow you know like fig- just have it, getting to play with all the extra stuff that have nothing to do with material this is so like that your, was, uh, i'm sorry go ahead go ahead yeah so it was just it was a great experience for that and then i did i was gonna yeah. say this is like your uh the beatles the beatles in germany yeah, yeah. it's like right? hamburg for uh whatever yeah, yeah yeah nice okay so you don't do your first open mic until after college i mean yeah. real open mic until after college and that's in los angeles yeah the ice house uh oh, nice. the, the afternoon like a afternoon <laughs> try on front dave mcnary who just passed away not too long ago but um he used to run the the sunday night showcase thing but he would do the i just called him and back in those days when you called on a landline to the comedy club and they said, yeah, we have tryouts once a month. It's like at one o'clock, again, like an afternoon show. So it's bright sunshine. Time. You go in there. Yeah. And it's uh, there were probably 15 comedians that back then it wasn't as big of a deal as it is now. But And we all just went up one at a time and did a couple minutes. And he would judge us and say, okay, you can you can come and work for free. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Welcome so to the, the first, They give you a little card that said your name. you write your name on it. It was a dollar off. Uh, or like a little coupon thing, which is not, I don't even know if that was real or not, but basically they wanted to see how many people would come with your name on the card, right? Mm. And you would get a dollar for every person who came. So the annex held, I think it held like 75 people. Like back then, I know I just saw it, the other, I just did it set there the other day and it was, they called something else, but the brand new and it's all nice and big. But back then it was like 75 people. That first night I did a set, um, there were, I think 60, 65 people with my name on the card. Wow. The seventy-five. They're like, this dude's so, a bringer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasted that because you know I got a dollar. Had I known that that sixty bucks was going to be the most I'd make at comedy for the next three or four years, I probably would have That's... enjoyed a little more. But I was scared out of my mind. But it was so many people that just like, yes, finally you're doing it. I mean, I've been talking about it since I was a kid. Wow. And it was finally, like, okay, so now we're finally getting to that. So I feel like a lot of people from college, you knew like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, cause APU is uh, Zeus is only 15 minutes away from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so you do your first open mic and then that leads to you working at the, at the ice house to some degree. (laughs) Well, only the annex. So I didn't even make it into the main room and I didn't know this, is how dumb I was. I just didn't know anything. I didn't know anyone who did stand up. I didn't know. I didn't have, I had no idea. And so they would give you another set like three months later. So mm. for the first two years, I probably did 10 sets total, not knowing like, oh, like, you, oh, you got to just... other places. <laughs> yeah. And what, but I knew of other places, but I didn't know how to get into those. Right. That's how and I am now. So I'd ask around until like the um, comedy store, I went down and did that. But you signed at that time, you signed up on Sunday, the week before you got in line and whoever you put your name on a list and then they would say, okay, you uh, set next Sunday at 7 PM or whatever. So you Jeez. come back the next Sunday to do a set. Um, and that and that one was just because it was in summer, we were, I don't know which room it is. It's overlooking the 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 road there, but it was bright sunshine again, zero audience members. Not a single person was there. And they just brought us up one, there were 20 of us that brought us up one at a time. We each did two minutes, they gave us a light. Wow. In and, front of a, in, and in nobody, front of but you're like the, the, the only the row of comedians were standing in the back <laughs> waiting to go up. But there was yeah, and they're, not, they're not, not laughing because they're in their own no. head with their sets, right? Literally, not a oh, single dude. person in the audience. Like, and the guy goes, "Hey, do you have a good time? Like, for to do what? To practice using the microphone? I know how to use the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you and, end? Like, go sorry. And then I did the Laugh Factory back then too, which is uh, so I was I had a day job at the time. Cause I couldn't survive on the 60 bucks I made two years earlier. 
Um, <laughs> and I so it. I called in sick and went down to do the Laugh Factory. And they, I had heard at 7 p.m. Or, or maybe like 6 p.m., they would make a list of whoever the first 25 people in line at 6 p.m. would be on the show that night. It's like a Tuesday, right? Mm. So I had heard through people that go, and you know, this is before internet and all that. So you're just, you, where are you even getting information? Um, homeless people mostly, but they just said, <laughs> oh, I heard that people have to get there like at uh, eight or nine in the morning to get in line. So I'm like, okay, if I'm taking a, one of my sick days, I better be in the group. So I got down there. I got up super early. I got down there at 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. I was third in line at 6.45 wow. in the morning. Wow. And sat there on the street all day long and burned every part of me. Yeah, no cell phone either. No, no, no. <laughs> no. no. And I didn't even have a friend to like, will you hold my spot while I go get food? Like it was just, you're just going to have to sit there. And wow. a bunch Burn. of, you know how like weird sometimes, like, when you get like uh, like professional comics, there's some sort of courtesy level, and you got you respect each other. But that was early days of open mic stuff. It's like cutthroat for nothing. Like there, yeah. I don't even know why they're cutthroat, but it's cutthroat for nothing sometimes. Yeah, at least L.A. it was at that time. It felt like so. I wasn't gonna lose my. I wasn't gonna get out because no one said anything about saving anybody's spots. Like you had to bring a friend and kind of whatever. Anyway, so I sat there all day long. So for twelve hours, sat on the street and bright and at sell or whatever then i sign up and i went to my truck and now i'm too far away to go home so i took a nap in my truck got some food changed my shirt <laughs> nice and went in and did my set and then afterwards you wait and jamie's gonna give you notes right so it's close to midnight by the time i get he gets to me now i've been there for <laughs> whatever 18 hours on on property yeah and his he goes oh let me see um uh, yeah, pretty good jokes. Good joke writer. You just, you're just not committed enough. <laughs> oh my goodness! Go, you know what? I, you know what I mean by that? And I go, nah, but I'll figure it out and drive home. And I just walked. I'm like, I'm so tired. And you're gonna tell me I'm not. I've been here all day. Wow. Like, so that oh, was okay. Hold on. Wow. I gotta tell you. I gotta tell you this story real quick. I gotta tell you this story. You talk about people saying the wrong thing to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I go to a basketball camp. And at the end of the basketball camp that week, I was awarded the best rebounder of the camp. And then at the end of the, then the coaches, the guy who's running the camp, a guy named Curtis Owens. I'm putting his name out there. Whoa. Curtis, yeah, Curtis Owens. He goes around. He's kind of critiquing everyone. And he comes to me and he goes, well, you know, Reg, you know, you, you play hard. You do this, that, and the other. But, you know, just sometimes I feel like you lack heart. Mm. And I was like, <laughs> I just got the rebounding award for the best. Re That's all heart. Right, yeah. that's all. I'm that's all. all heart, mother. Right, I'm trying to keep my corporate work. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I mean, but so for you to be also to, for you to be at a place for 18 hours, sunburnt. Wow. Right, to do a thing, and for a guy to say you're not committed enough, it's like, <clears throat> yeah, you know what? Uh, you keep that. I'm gonna go home, and I'm gonna go do something else somewhere else because this is some bullshit. Is that how you ended up in San Francisco? You just kept driving. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's really. Like, you know, like, I'm, I'm just gonna keep here. going until I run out of gas. No, so about a year, uh, well, sometime later, I moved, I, my best friend who was my roommate was getting married, so I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to Colorado. I'm going to move to Denver. I like it there. I visited and thought it was fun. I have some family in the area. I'm going to move there for a year and see what it's like to live in a different city just to have that experience because I'm young enough and see if there's a comedy scene. I had no idea what the comedy scene was like back because, again, I didn't know a lot of stuff. So I came here and then I uh, eventually won the open mic or the new talent competition the next year and became a regular at comedy works, which is one of the best clubs in the country. And then immediately started working every week, getting sets and working with the best comedians that came through every week. Like it's like a showcase club. So you get to, you don't just get your one week, you get every week I sign up and we get sets with wow. every comedian that came through. So my wow. first weekend that I tried out was Kathleen Madigan but like Brian Regan, like every big name that came out of the late 90s, early 2000s came through here. So I got to meet all of them and work with them and become friends with them. And so wow. I kept thinking I was going to move with them. I was like, but it's just like, it was so great. It's good, yeah. And yeah. you can do, you know, stuff from here. Not like, it's not like East Coast, but you could do mountain shows, like one nighters, all those kinds of things. I just worked all the time. It's just that no one saw it outside, like on a big picture. Mm -hmm. so i have always done that where i do sets every week and like i went and did a set last night i'll do sets every night i could go out and do something 
Wow. It's just you don't see it on a national scale, and it kind of that's the problem with Colorado is, or Denver. In some way, it's just taking a long time for us to get any sort of exposure out of that. But at some point, then I moved back to San Francisco because my high school buddies had a place, and I like, yeah, I'm gonna try San Francisco. I've never lived there. I was a, so I did. That's what I did. So I lived there for four years. That's where I met was with you guys. Where'd you Where'd you live out in the in SF? Uh, California, twenty second. Oh, the okay. Richmond. Yeah. Yeah, I lived take the, out there in the Richmond. I lived yeah. at thirty third and Geary. Yeah, so I used to take the number one spells like number two, all the way down yeah. to the comedy club. <laughs> easy, easy joke. So yeah, so I, yeah, I worked at the Park Hyatt across the street, which is now something else. But I uh, waited tables there in the morning, and then did sets at night. So I did that for there for four years. Dude, you're like one of the hardest working people I know in comp ever. With no <laughs> results, Reggie. <Dude. laughs> well, hey, I mean, dude. Rod White's a good story. I was going to yeah, say, a- and you, dude, you had a, you've had a, a lengthy career. Like you've yeah. been able to work. You stayed working, bro. Look, I, I just got to say yeah. this because I've seen this all the time with comics, especially guys who are hilarious. I've sat in the back of the room and watched Arge Barker destroy the punchline. It's packed house. He kills it. There's one guy there's one guy who's not who didn't like his pants. Who didn't like his pants or whatever, and he walks off. And I go, "Yo, Arch, that's awesome, man! It's a true story." I go, "Arch, that was great, man! You killed it." And he's like, "Yeah, but this one guy in the front, I'm like, I know, dude, that's comedians." I'm like, "Did you did you not wow. see the other 184 <laughs> people out of the 185 who were absolute?" What I'm saying to you, Chris, is that you've done it, bro. <laughs> like, well, you okay, done it. I appreciate that. I appreciate yes. it. Yes. Uh, Sal has seen the movie, so he knows I've iterated this stuff in the in the film as well. Okay. But all of my uh, all of my angst and all of my issues, they're pretty much laid out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's pretty. Uh, where can we catch it? Honest. I want to see it. Is it you gonna? Well, that, that's a. Um, or? Yeah, I, I, it's not right now. It's not available. I'm trying to do film festivals right now. So I did. I showed it a couple times. I'm gonna show it. Well, I'll, I'll show it. I'm going to show it in the Bay Area. I'll send you something. I'm going to do something. Okay. Because uh, okay. I headline uh, punchline uh, Jan- June 6th, D days they gave me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I said that, and there was like silence on the other end. Like, uh-huh. okay, okay, That's well, funny. Uh, I guess, I mean, most people know that date. But, like, uh, is that your opener? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you think that was bad? Wait till you see what's what happens tonight. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> I'll be there then. Yeah. So that during, so it ha- kind of what happened just to kind of skip ahead to that. You didn't ask me about the film, but I'm going to talk about. Yeah. But um, during like when COVID and the shutdown and all that sort of stuff, I only had one job right. for the first time in decades. Yeah. Which was I was just teaching, and I had a lot of free time that I just couldn't figure out. Like, what do you do with this? What? And so I had an idea I'd had for a long time for to write a screenplay. So I wrote, um, I wrote the screenplay. Then I'd never written a screenplay, so I'm trying to follow what, like, what is it supposed to look like in the format. And um, I'm good friends. I'm going to name drop. Good friends with Bobcat uh, Goldthwait, and so he helped me like kind of figure out some stuff. And then he, I went and stayed with him, and uh, had him read it because he was going to kind of look at it. And he said, "Yeah, you have all the beats of like what the sport story should be." And that's primarily because I've taught literature for so many years. I know like storyline, I know story structure and all that. So I basically just followed what I have taught nice. <laughs> about story structure and the hero's journey and all that. That's just but sweet. not knowing that that was also how they would structure a screenplay. So anyway, so that's what how I came about writing it. I wrote it for someone else, um, but that person didn't uh, read it or <laughs> decide one. How come do that. that name didn't get dropped? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Sal told me about that one. That's was, uh, funny that and then, uh, so I just read it for myself, and then it was um, well. That basically, I called somebody. I, I said, "What what would it cost to do this?" Because I was hoping Bobcat would like take it on and go, "All right, here." And then I would yeah. get, I would get to say, "Oh, look, that's what <laughs> I wrote." <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and. He's like, no, you got all these notes in here about like shots and music and stuff. So you obviously already have it in your head. You should do it yourself. And I said, does that mean you hate it? And you just are trying to like play it off? Or and he's like, no, it's fine. You just, you already have the story. So you're going to be frustrated if you see anyone else do it. So just get yourself a DP, director of photography, those in the biz. Okay. And uh, have them just shoot it the way you see it in your head. So that's, so anyway, I asked around and the range of like money was like crazy. A couple hundred thousand. I'm like, I don't have that kind of money. So then it, it got to my buddy Wade, who I worked with before, and 
I said, this is what I want to do. How can we do the cheapest possible? So I had to rewrite some things, combine some things. But we end up doing three days for 25000 And no one believes that. Like, like they, I mean, they believe it. They just go, that's like, how do you do that? And then I think I've, I say this quite often. People are like, that is nothing. And I go, yeah, it's nothing if it's not your money out of your right, savings account. Right, right. right. 25000 feels like something. Hell yeah. Right. Where you go for a vanity project that you don't know if anyone will ever see. Um, so anyway, I feel really good about it. But anyway, so that's what, that's how that came about. What's the what's it based off of the Greek literature? Because uh, I think my ignorance hurt me in, uh, in the viewing. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get all the uh, literary references? Yeah, and literary. I figured you know what you're talking about, so I'd ask you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it is based on Dante's Purgatorio to some degree. So mm. it involves... so the, Just so only obviously people listening or watching... They don't know anything about the story, but the story is about a cowboy poet who lives in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and he's going to do a gig in Durango. So it's about a six hour drive. And basically I made it, that's all the same sort of elements of being a comic, but it's a cowboy poet. I didn't want to be a comedian. Which is a real thing. I didn't know. And then I asked yeah. him at the end of the film and then I looked it up when I got home, but yeah, cowboy poets were. A thing. Yeah. And they used to be on the tonight show. Like the, the couple names I drop in the film are the guys that were regularly Carson would have on That's and they come out oh, and wow. do that. They would do their, their poems. And then they would be like sort of celebrities around the country, especially in the Southwest. They would do these poems. They're all supposed to be kind of funny, humorous, you know, Americana anecdotes. Um, so <clears throat> that's the story is him and it involves magical realism, which is a literary genre that is um, popular, particularly with uh, Gabriel Marquez. So that is in there, which allows for things to be not logical. Some things that kind of go, oh, how does that? But with no explanation. Yeah. So that allowed some things to happen in the film. And then it, like I say, loosely follows the purgatorial. So there's the different levels as you go up the ladder to heaven is what so most people know uh have heard of dante's inferno which is going down to hell there's all the seven layers right. down to hell <clears throat> this is the next chapter next book in that series and he's going up to go to heaven wow and, I, in the I didn't know about that second book in the purgatorio it's uh, his guide is this uh is virgil and virgil guides him all the way until the last part and there was only one person I knew. I like when I wrote it, I'm like, the person this will be is Clinton Jackson. If you guys oh, know Clinton, yeah. You know Clinton. Yeah, I know Clinton. Clinton's the So best. he was we, we from the beginning, that. that was the only person I had for that. And partly because we've done those drives before. <laughs> also, yeah. I knew, you know, he's done enough acting and stuff. So, um, and I think Sal can say he did a fantastic job. Yeah, and the rapport between the two of us, I think, really works on screen. You had a lot of good comedic actors or comedians who acted, yeah. which is cool to see because I feel yeah. like comedians are good actors. It's just sometimes you got to find it, you know. Quentin Jackson right, and I a... did a movie together too. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, one that was written and produced and directed by Michael Meehan. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, 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 and so it was calling him, basically Clinton going, I know I've never written a screenplay. I've never directed I've never produced, I've never put something together, but, and I've never acted, but I would like you to do this film with me. <laughs> um, it was like, he's like, yeah, sure. When, when do you, so it was working around uh, his schedule, my his schedule. And then I got some other comedians that came in for like half day to do the little, the little part. And I was also trying to time it out, you know, part of trying to, with low budget, trying to get it so it works. Uh, was to time it out when the leaves were changing in, in Colorado so you get like the, the scenery and the visual part looks good and using my vehicle so it was all my vehicle so I didn't have to borrow and we and normally you'd have them on trailers and you'd have the cameras and all that we just put cameras inside the car and I drove and acted and tried to direct and all the things at the same time and wow That's and we didn't style. there was no there were no dailies so we just hoped that we had it and I just, <laughs> we'll find out later when we are editing if we got all the shots or if we missed some stuff He's okay. got some beautiful drone shots in it too, where that's so cool now they now you could do that. And with Colorado and the row, oh, it was pretty. Yeah, so yeah, so it kind of makes it seem like a bigger film. It really yeah. does. Like I was like, oh man, look what you could do now with drones. It was dope. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So I'm thinking, is this something uh along the lines of like reservoir dogs where it kind of takes place in what the fuck? <laughs> well, no, I'm just thinking in the sense of like 
you know, not the storyline. That's how you associate reservoir dogs. Yeah. It happens in one day. You, no, not one day. I'm just somebody in one place. Like it's it's kind of. Oh yeah, you heard Clinton Jackson. You're like, there's got to be a lot of murders. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody um, dies of the well, end. no, because I'm I've tried. I couldn't think of another no, no. film where it's like it kind of takes place Every, in one place. Even though... Well, so this is mostly a road story. Okay, so, so I mean, it's, yeah, the... yeah. So we're in we're in. Uh, it starts in whatever the town in Las Vegas, that t- town. So you have one shot of that, and then it's driving in an old truck. And there's a creek scene there on the side of the road for a little while. And then they're in the car most of the time. So there's, a, okay. and there's a one to switch to a stingray at some point. And then, oh, but it's mostly uh, takes place in the vehicle though. Yeah. Just most the- of it's in the vehicle. Yeah. That's okay. what I say. So we had three cameras inside the vehicle, right? but no one like, obviously, so you're not on a trailer, you're actually driving. So it's, right. there was someone in a vehicle in front of us that could hear what we were saying, but not see any of the, what's footage being shot. Mm. So we had a separate like mic so they could hear that. So they could go, I think we missed a part. We may need to go back and do that. Like, but I, you know, I'm trying to like generate with the conversation and keep the script going while also trying to not wreck obviously, but drive right. and then also try to act in a moment. So oh, dude, I got to see this film, man. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, that makes it sound like it's amazing. I, I, I'm really proud of it. I think it's good. I don't know if it's great, but I think it's good. I'm not, it's not something I'm ashamed of at all. And, and the idea, and people say, well, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to show people for initially. I'm going to send around the film festivals. And then it eventually will probably end up online, I guess, if I don't have other, if I can't find someone to uh, stream it or something like that. But if nothing else, I, a real sense of accomplishment. I've done something I hadn't done before, which is always on my list of things of trying to go, well, this is something I haven't done. I want to try that. And uh, hopefully it showcases some other things I can do besides uh, telling jokes on stage. Getting it finished is so hard. With yeah, films, yeah. man, getting it made. I will say it's funny with Chris Voth. You try and break this man's character. He's very, you know, it's very straight. And I got to see a real side of this man because after the film, I caught his little Back to the Future Part Two reference. He snuck in there, <laughs> and to see your your joy when you're like, "Oh, you got that!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. It was there was nice um. Moment. There's a bunch of like I guess people would call it meta kind of stuff, but it some. I use actual uh, conversations from other films and things <laughs> Oh wow. in the That's middle cool. of it, but without yeah. mentioning it. So either you okay. understood that these were like, oh, those are things. So there's other films right. I missed. What other movie references are well, I there? Well, that's the only film one. I mean, I do oh, the okay. little Fall Guy thing, obviously. Right, but, right. Uh, okay. But there's uh, there are two parts that are uh, almost word for word from Andy Griffith episode oh that's funny dude awesome. that's awesome. i'm sure no one that i'm sure I'm, no oh well my brother my brother knew it my i love Andy Griffin doing that. well hold on chris i gotta say this man um congratulations on doing this whole film making it happen yeah, yeah. um but this is the first one right yeah so i say yeah, do it you again, never know bro. yeah do it again like I have I have a couple of script ideas. I have one that I've outlined. I've got a, I have them outlined. So I um it's now like how do I come up with more money that I am willing to just throw down a hole. So <laughs> if I can get some of the money back from this first one, I will do a second one right away. But okay, is uh okay. is Ron White retired for comedy? Are you done with that? And then how um, did how did Mister Chris White Collar get with Ron Blue Collar? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um. So I it was a fill in for someone else uh, in Colorado. So this, he had he had about three or four openers that he was rotating, and okay. when he was in um, in Colorado for this is like four years ago, uh, weekend of shows, uh, two over in Grand Junction and one here in Denver. And the opener he had couldn't do it, and so through my Booker and stuff, they like well we'll put your name in there and see if they choose you. And so they chose me based on my late late show appearance. We don't need to say that post and um so the one first of all grand this does it's not just a long story but um i said hey i so the tour manager emailed me i said i know you guys love golf and i'm a fanatic golfer so i said uh, i'm gonna be playing a certain course over there if you guys want to whatever and i was like i hope it's up to his level of golf and um so they go yeah that's great how about you do it on the saturday morning and we'll pay for it and like yeah free golf is even better so uh, I played, and I'm a, I'm not going to say I'm a great golfer, but a good golfer. Um, I'm down to like a single digit handicap. So I uh, I see it like basketball. You can work on it and work on it and get pretty good at it. So that's why. So uh, we played, and he they said, 
wow, you're a good golfer for a, especially for a comedian. How do you have the time and money to do this? Because most of them don't. <laughs> and so they said, well, you want to do some more weekends with us? Because, you know, that would be great. And then I did one more that year. And then I, the next year they gave me a bunch. And then I started, wow. basically became his, one of his regular guys that I would do, you know, every, I did at least once a month I was out. So I used up lots of sub days flying in and out to go, you know, do all that. And then after COVID came back, um, he said, I'm going to do another year and a half. And if you want to do every show for the rest of my career, you can do those. So that's when I took a sabbatical of teaching and did. So we did over the last, I looked it up. So we did, uh, I did 220 shows total with Ron. Wow. So not all that's those awesome. theaters, but um, cause we did a couple of comedy club weeks to getting ready for the theater stuff after COVID, but. I say after COVID, after COVID lockdown. I know there's no after COVID, but. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, and then his retirement was New Year's Eve, although I know I, he's been out. He's, I, I think he'll always do sets. I just don't know if he'll ever go back to actually, you know, that's the question everybody asks me. Is he going to, is he really retired? I don't know. Uh, you know, okay. I can't be inside of his head. I know he did 30 years at such an amazing level selling out theaters in every corner of the country. People think it's the South, but it's like everywhere. We went everywhere we went, he sold tickets and he doesn't do any of the things you have to do to now to like sell tickets. He doesn't have a mm -hmm. podcast and didn't, didn't have a TV show. doesn't have a movie. doesn't have, you know, wow. like, yeah. tickets yeah. go on sale for Ron White and they would sell out. And that would be wow. wherever have you, it was. What have you learned from him? Um, that you can be super lazy and successful. Uh, no, <laughs> I would say, no, no, that's, um, you know, I, I would say what I learned, I think the biggest thing I learned, I won't say from him, but I'll say it in terms of like just doing theater shows. That was a question for me was I have it. I didn't know if my act would work in theaters, you know, yeah. that's a thing. It's one thing to do a club, you figure out that and then you do, but you know, 2000, we did like the Fox theater is 4,000. The one in Houston is probably 5,000 seats for that. It's a lot of people in a room, in a big room with high ceilings, all that. And I don't have a, I'm not a big act out guy. I have very small jokes and that sort of thing. So just figuring out <clears throat> how to make that work and to make sure that pause and the way I like to tell jokes is a certain pace and quick under the breath kind of a thing. So I had to like work on that to get it to work initially, but it was just really, it was great to be able to make those shows go. I mean, they're obviously they're, they're there to see the show. So they're going to, they're happy, but they're not there to see me. So right. you got the first couple minutes of like, no, this guy, who's this guy? Right. And but then once you get, get it going and then be able to work, like I said, a big room, that was really a, a muscle I hadn't ever really worked. So that was fun to do. Wow. You know, I um, I think this is a testament too to, I think you're very funny, obviously. You're very talented. But... There's no heart. <laughs> yeah, right. you guys tell me? No you're not dedicated yeah. no dedication and no heart I'm not... I don't know how you did it so no but what I was going to say is you know I've been Sal and I both have been fortunate enough to be able to travel with headliners and work with them on a regular basis for for some period of time and the thing that I've that I've learned from those experiences is that um, it's never just about the jokes right like it's one thing to be talented and be funny but it's also being able to like you did play golf with them right there's more yeah. to it than just you know performing it's also the the relationship that you have with the people um that can take you a, can give you a ton of opportunity right because i'm sure that you guys are able to you know communicate effectively or on some level where it's like okay yeah this is this is a cool this is a dude i want to hang out with while also working with Right. There's also just the professional part about, are you going to show up? Are you going to miss your flight? Are you going to be right. too drunk to get on the bus? Like, exactly. Can all I trust the stuff you to do that your job? When we started out, there was a lot of those guys and some mm -hmm. of them made it for a while. And some just, you just got tired of the BS go like, look, we're trying to all trying to work. Yes. So <clears throat> yeah, doing that and uh, being able to contribute in whatever ways and understanding your role in the, on the team that all that is part of it. Are um, you um, a better golfer than Ron White? Come on now, we didn't gotta say that. I'm not asking. What's uh, what's what? Uh, you so, know, so about the controversy. Lot. Just try to get some views. Um, Just say we're I'm all not, good in our own way. If you <laughs> so, there's a we did a golf channel little uh, clip. You can watch that uh, that we just did in in the fall, which uh, turned out to be really a great experience for me, but also has hooked me up with 
what may turn out the next part, which I, I can't share here, but I will all come on later on when I'm doing all right. with that one. The press um, tour. But um, I would say Ron is a great golfer and also, especially for his age, I don't think you can look up his age, but you know he's in his late 60s and he's a, and a good golfer. And um, I see some other comedians who are known as golfers. This is why I pushed him so hard to go. You got to do this golf channel thing because there are there are other comedians out there, big name comedians who are taking this thing that they're they're a golfing comedian. Like, yeah, but they're terrible golfers. Right. So <laughs> you need to slide in there to remind them that not only are you a great comic, but also. All right, let me rephrase it. Is there any comedic golfers that are better than you? Because you sound like you're good, dude. No, I, I golf is like one of those deals, though. You can, uh, there are lots of good golfers. I don't know. What's I, your handicap? You my handicap you... now is like an eight. That's pretty good. That's yeah. pretty good. Okay. All right. Well, cool. So, I mean, you got I, anything else I, for this doctor? <laughs> I don't man, know. Man, I mean, you know, we, we talk so much got sports. a whole and, bunch. Yeah, man. I mean, we talk football and we talk basketball. I was kind of curious. Like, there's a stretch after the open mics before meeting Ron and before the movie where in San Francisco is like, were there any Montreal callbacks? No. Like, was there? Um, so I tried out three times and that guy with a hat told me the same thing every single time. Which was, he said, you tell your jokes too fast. That was really? the only note. That was the note he gave me all three times. That's funny. Wow. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, funny, but you just tell your jokes too fast. That's funny. And that was all I got. <laughs> and I would, and my response was the, after the second time and probably the third time, I'm like, well, I was going by the audience. If they can keep up, I would think you could too. But yeah, ah, that, that doesn't really, ah, that hey. does not help you get in, by the way. That does not yeah, help. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, so no, I, I did, um, I got lucky. I mean, I did Last Comic Standing three different times. And one of those was the first time was when I was in San Francisco. And I actually I called in sick to the Park Hyatt and then stood in line outside for seven That's hours. That's funny. So they could see me from the window that I was not sick because I was. <laughs> that was, that was the second season. Yeah, second I think season. I was outside for that too. I was with Eli yeah. and Robert Sealander. And then I, um, funny. And then I was on it two more times after that, uh, with various like basically the same thing. I would be in all the promos, so people thought I was in it for a long time, and yeah. and then never made it past like second round. Here's something um, we didn't talk about. He living in LA was roommates with Kevin Shea. Oh, you and Shea lived together <laughs> for about sixty days. Oh, really? Okay. What happened there? Yeah, he, it's probably Shea. 40, fi- probably forty-five days too long, but about. How 60 did you wise up that say quick? Well, we've also had Kevin Avery on, and he was living with Kevin Shea, two-time Emmy <laughs> oh, winner. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's a that's that's more for of a therapy session. I don't think we need that, <laughs> but. But Shay did come. Were you there the night that um, would not you came? No, the I was there the following. Yeah, yeah, I miss. He did come to the film he, though. He that's there. right. Yeah, he was there. Oh, um, well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. We're we're still we're okay. It's because you uh, moved there's out. There's some people you could be friends with and be comedy friends with, and you don't need to live with. How about that? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. One at my that. age and my uh, particularness and having whatever income. I have not had roommates. I don't want to live with other people. I have a very specific way I like to be. So that's we can tell by your more organized me picture. than anything else. So I'll we just get... say that. Nice. Um, yeah. So I mean, I moved back. I did some stuff. You know, I, was t- I started teaching. At some point, I went. I'm not. I can't live on this hundred dollars <laughs> bar gigs and whatever else for a while. You just so. Um, and I done. Uh, I did uh, late late so the late late show. No, that happened later. But I had done. Like I said, a couple of the last comic stands. I did my did an album recording that I did myself, and then didn't go anywhere. Like I was just selling it after shows and stuff. And you go, I don't know how to make money doing this mm. at any level where I was, and I didn't have enough money to like take six months or a year off to go, you know, just whatever. So I took a job teaching. That's what happened. I decided, well, I've been such a teaching here and there to make a little bit of money. I'll try teaching. So I got a teaching full-time teaching job at that time. I didn't need a license because it was a charter school. Now you do, but, um, and I loved it. Like I loved it immediately in a way that I never thought I would. And just because wow. I liked the students and I worked at a rough school where I got threatened and some things that were not great, oh, wow. but I loved the students. and I loved the, I loved all of it. Well, not wow. all of it. I didn't like the super threats. Early and I, yeah. Uh, having to do some of the, you know, whatever, but, 
but the students in that relationship was phenomenal and it gave me something to you know comics spend a lot of time sitting around thinking about themselves and thinking mm. about how much their career and i have all day i have got like 30 kids in a room and i need to be thinking about them and what they're going through and what they're so it gave me a chance to get out of my own head and be focused on other people which is wow very cliche but so true so i started teaching and I, that's when i went all right well if i'm going to all right, let me think. Okay, if this is going to be my backup, then I want to have a good backup. So I got my license, which took a year of teaching. And so I was doing shows, you know, nights, weekends, and then obviously at the summer, I would go out and do the San Francisco stuff and all that. Wow. And then I did, you know, did I did the Riviera a couple of times in Vegas, those kinds of things. Oh, yeah, I did that. Back in the day when you could get a week there. Yeah. And um, so I was still, this is all, I was in Denver. And then I like, well, you know, I'll get my master's because then that way, if I need to get a job, I'll have a, I can get a job. So took a couple of years and got my master's and then I'm like, well, I'm on the, I'm only halfway there. I might as well just keep going. So then I did the four years of getting a doctor. But what happened when the, the moment I stopped doing like hustling to do, like trying to do any sort of uh comedy club weeks was and one-nighters was that i was home a lot and so then i started getting corporate gigs and i started making more money but mm -hmm. working one night a week and that i started trying to balance of like do i stay on stage i'm a teacher or do i you know how we people pretend they don't have another job that's right thing. right and then at some point i just embrace them like you know what i'm gonna say this is what i do i do both of these things and i just like i said just kept getting corporate gigs and so i've balanced so I would do corporate stuff and do cl some club stuff. I just didn't do, there's not enough money for me in clubs. I don't make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, but did well enough to where I had a really, the life I wanted, which was pretty good salary that I didn't have to worry about what I made for the gigs. And then I would take the gigs I wanted. And so that's what I've just done for that big block of time. It's the balance. Um, the 10 years that I go, what did I do during those 10 years? And uh, it's a lot of that. And then I got a late, late show set and um but what's next do you go back to teaching now or um so that's the question that's a great movie question. Making a question i've had this up? morning already actually really yeah. um wow. i have a couple things um that i'm waiting to find out what's going to happen so right now they're hiring for teachers for the fall i'm okay on money for a while but i just want to go i'm just one of those that likes to stay ahead of it i don't want to get where i'm down to right teach. so right um if I had the perfect scenario, I would be, I, I would still teach. I think I just love it. I like being around the students. And I like having that interaction. I just went through a box full of um, like how many jobs you get notes and cards and all this stuff from people. That Awful, you were around yeah. with, like, right, and, right. and you get, I got a note. I just got a message on, uh, on Instagram just yesterday about someone I was a teacher. It was 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. And just talking about what an influence I was in his life and all that, blah, blah, blah. But it's wow, you know, that cool, man. That's just, what it's about though. Yeah. Right? So it that's just the really real life is a stuff. great, um, right now teaching's getting hit super hard by obviously right-wing people, but it's always been a difficult job and now it's being made even more difficult. And mm. I just, I have a heart for the kids, but I also have a heart for the educators that go into this trying to do what they're the best they can to help people right. and they get hammered on every side. Right. And I mean, it's one thing to be, have the risk of being shot. It's the other thing to have people screaming at you that you're trying to, you know, do something like, I'm just trying to get your kid to learn how to read. Yeah. <laughs> really. yeah I don't right. care about the other stuff. And, and yeah. I'm trying to help oh your kids God. graduate and have a life that they can be proud of. And so. Dude, that's yeah, perfect. The other stuff is not there. Anyway, so that's kind of, I think. That's you just have the one album? You just have that? So we just, I just did another one last year, and that just got released a week ago. Oh, what's okay. it called? Uh, it's called Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead Tired. Yes. Okay. Yes. Nice. So that, what is that? Like on, on Sirius and Pandora? Spotify, yeah, so I think it, it's on Sirius. Um, uh, the, I know Apple Music. Okay. Nice, um, man. It's one of those 800-pound okay. gorilla went through. Oh, cool. Dan Dion back in the day, if you remember Dan, yeah. Oh, yeah. remember through him well, and uh, wait, Dan on, Dion, I think it's on bad. He, I think it's been moved to bad password, but anyway, same, same, whatever. Okay. Dan Dion, the photographer, he has something to do with eight hundred pound gorilla. Yeah. yeah, we don't need to talk about it here, but yes, that's how. That's the connection. I know. Uh, I, didn't oh, know wow. I didn't know I that. I was just talking up Dan Dion's photos. I was at the punch two weeks ago. That's yeah, hilarious. That funny, huh? yeah. yeah. I'm gonna have that's to hit up funny. that Dan Dion. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, real quick, Chris. Um, yeah. I think I think you have one more movie. There's a I just got the idea when you're talking about oh, teaching boy, and the go. student. Oh boy, he's pitching them already. It's just I am. It's just the idea of a comedian. It's a comedian meets dangerous minds. You're talking about being threatened. It's the idea of, you know, because we've seen it with it's titled you know, uh Stand Up and Deliver. Is that what you is that's that what I was gonna I was thinking stand up hey, and deliver. And I got it. Like the, the main but, but it's stand up and deliver. See it's stand up and deliver. Yeah, you get and oh, the main tough play. kid who's a heckler is two time Oscar winner and Reggie's or friend, Mahershala Ali. No, that will get yeah, made. Yeah. That movie yeah. will get made. You want to Can either of you guys play high school students? Are you I was gonna to say he's way too old to play. I can play the janitor. Can I do janitor? I love that idea right there. The idea that a teacher was able to meet to to get through the kids with humor. It's been done a million times, dude. With humor? <laughs> with humor. Oh, Gangster's Paradise is funny dude, song. Hold up though. Sal, this is the thing. The industry, they love remakes. They love anything that's been successful. You come with something original, they go, well, we'll think about it. But if you say, oh, it's the Cosby show, meet some well, not Cosby show. We'll come with another well, show. Well, a doctor, another doctor. Yeah, I remember Jim Belushi. It's different this world meets Seinfeld. 80s. And they go, oh, that's great. We'll just put, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm just saying, I just think that it would be, I think it's a good idea. The idea of a comedian who was able to reach the kids with humor. Well, and- I like how you're like, I came up with this movie idea. Like what? He goes to the inner city school. And, wow, that's never been done, Reg. <laughs> It's uh, not about it not being done. So, you know, we could talk about this off air because. <laughs> well, let me just do a couple know, quick love... ones that have been okay. done. Okay. Uh, and then just because I like to talk about it. They, do, so, well. Denver, they do well. By the way, there's Denver Comics, the Growlix guys. They did uh, Those Who Can't, if you saw that, if you remember that sitcom that was on. You probably don't. But anyway, yeah. it was one of those. There are Denver comedians who played teachers in Denver. And I was like, wait, this is my story. Why are you guys doing this? <laughs> That's um funny. but they they had that one and then um and abbott elementary is really good um yeah. right now yeah i've heard about that i haven't watched and it but i've heard it's great this is what i want to say about that because i you know, starting from a uh, bad teacher basically on there was like a seven or eight or five seven year run where um teachers were the like oh how about a one where the teachers are the bad guy where they do something crazy or they're always drunk and stuff like that <laughs> and you know there was a i can name off a whole bunch of versions of that but what i love about abbott is this is the part about it you don't you have to remember is teachers are not paid well i mean we only know that and under adverse conditions all the stuff so they have to want to be there there has to be right you know, talking about mm-hmm. the, the heart there has to be a heart at the center of it otherwise you would quit day two maybe three because it's just so hard so i do love that's why i would just want to say, i don't know anybody on abbott i'm just saying i like that show because they are featuring the part that is often overlooked which is why are these people doing this job right and those they are doing it because they love the kids or they love they really feel like they're trying to make a difference and nice. i don't usually talk about that too much because it's kind of but i that's the angle that I always take, I have seen a few other uh, comedians who have been teachers or are teachers or things. And the jokes are always about the students. And I always think that's kind of not how I see it. Right. It's, right. Um, <clears throat> to me, it's, uh, yes, there are funny things they say, but at the heart of it, I love the students. I was always felt like I was in a sitcom all day long. Keep going, like this is nice. And I had no, <laughs> and I, but I didn't have any of the funny lines. They had all the funny lines because they would just hammer me with stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's good. But we're trying to work on grammar. So, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> Well, I wasn't, I didn't want you to make fun of the kids. I just wanted you to. No, no I know. I didn't know that's not what you said. I was just saying, I was yeah. doing it as a side thing as a, uh, as a frame that. Cause some well, you, them. you definitely made me want to watch Abbott Elementary. Cause I've heard that it was everyone that, I, everything that I've read about it has been like phenomenal. They're like the critics, lo- critics love it. And the people love yeah, it. Yeah, it's won so. many Emmys. Yeah. Yeah. So, but okay, all right. Well, I was let's wrap this up, there, dude. So. Let's say goodbye to our good friend. <laughs> okay. I really appreciate. Do we? Do we? Do we have time, dude? Robert? Uh, did we get? A, did we hit enough? Did we get? This is this is like this is like another podcast that goes three hours. That's that, yeah. I didn't think that was your podcast. <laughs> right. I, I congratulate anyone who's listened through the whole episode. Yeah, there's Thank no you way. Right now. Now's the time I to drop so. all those names that you were going to drop before. <laughs> so really, tell us about Ron White now. <laughs> Here's a thing what? that no one knows about. <laughs> <laughs> and then cut. Oh, man. Well, well thanks, hey, man. It's great seeing you, Chris. Yeah, it's great yeah, seeing thanks, you Yeah, thanks, man. It's good seeing you. Congratulations on everything, man. It's been awesome. The masters, the doctorate, the teaching, the on the road, the film, the albums. It's like, dude, you're doing it. Just recognize that, right? Like you're in a place. Right. I'll, try to, really I'll try happening. to accept that. Seriously, hey, have you? Man. let me ask you this. You've probably played all the nice golf courses. You played Pebble Beach and everything. 
uh, Pebble Beach is not is one I haven't played, but oh really? Uh, yeah, but you've but played, I played a lot one. of good ones, huh? Yes, some very very good ones. Okay, okay. that's okay. cool, man. Well, yeah, that. and uh, we can't wait to hear what's coming up next, right? So yeah, I want to check out that Golf Channel thing. Yeah, yeah, check out that clip, and then we'll see what goes from there. All right, okay. cool, Sounds buddy. Good. All, All right, right Chris, take you, care, Chris. man. Have a great day. Thank Thanks, you, Doc. Thank you see for ya. taking the time too. Peace. Oh, there he is, Dr. Nice. Voss. Close, just closing it down. That's I like it. it. That's a great way to end. At first, I was like, is he going to show us his penis? I don't want to see That's that. a great way to end. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> weird. Yeah, it is weird. Um, All right, dude. Well, let's wrap dude, up. Dude, why are you making fun of my movie suggestion? I thought it was a good oh, idea. It's so, it's so been done. This is, No, no, no. But Sal, hold up, though. Before we get out of here, you understand that everything that's been done has, has been, been done, done repeatedly. <laughs> right. You know why they do it? Is because it wor- it sells. It, it sells and it right. works. And you got to remember too that you and I, we are no longer the target demographic. Yeah, There's but a, a white people, male teacher that it doesn't matter. sell, dude, dude. It doesn't matter. I, he don't. Need, I, he don't have to film it. I'm just saying, write the story, right? The sell story. it. Yeah, write this. It's it's what was it? Um, not what's the movie? Um. Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams. Yeah. Uh, he was able to reach the kids with his poetry right. with, with the literature or whatever. Obviously, Michelle Pfeiffer and Dangerous Minds. Uh, I forget uh James Amos, whatever not James Amos, but who's the guy that was uh I don't know. I know Belushi did one and he killed the guy. He killed <laughs> he had a shootout. Jim Belushi, his brother, did one in the 80s. Oh, it's okay. called the substitute or something. Well, okay. I would just think about dangerous, not dangerous minds, but the other one, Stand and Deliver. What I'm saying is that a lot of these films have been made, right? Um, but he can have a different slant. It doesn't necessarily have to be him as a white right. guy. It could just right. be a teacher who was able to reach the kids through humor, right? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Red <laughs> is steel, giving out the movie ideas. Hey, all right, man, my man. Well, like, good time. Maybe I should write that shit. Yeah, right. you write that down. I'm gonna need some help though. I have to reach out to somebody who can help me write that. I know a couple of people who write, so I'm gonna have to get them to. I come up with the right, idea. Dude, wrap us up, Reggie. Oh. Thanks for listening. All right, man. Yeah, you still are. This is a long episode, but it was fun. I mean, the football, the basketball. Oh boy, the, the I might film. have to cut this in two parts. Yeah, yo, maybe. Why not? Why not? Um, okay. Well, shout out to Chris Voss for taking the time, man. We really appreciate you. Uh, to everyone who's listening, if you stayed in the whole time, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't, we totally understand. <laughs> but uh, we love doing this. We're going to keep doing it. So if you like it, if you enjoy us, please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we'd appreciate it. Um, and with that said, that's Sal Kalani. And I'm Reggie Steele. And this is Spitballing. Peace. Peace. <laughs>